right, everybody. Thank you for being here today uh, for our first installment in our new monthly webinar series. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and afterwards the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody or ask everybody to uh, keep all of your microphones muted and your videos turned off. I'll also be uh, turning off any microphones or videos in the event that somebody might not realize that theirs is on. Um, but that way we can just avoid any interference with uh, the presentation here. Um, so the Arkansas Native Plant Society, we have decided uh, since our May webinar series went so well, we'd like to continue with these webinars and provide them on a monthly basis through the rest of the year and hopefully after that. Uh, to give a little background on the Arkansas Native Plant Society for anyone who might not be familiar with us, uh, we were formed in 1980 and our mission is to promote one, the preservation, conservation, study, and enjoyment of the native plants in Arkansas. Two, the education of the public regarding the value of native plants in their habitat. And three, the publication of related material and information. If you'd like to learn more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society, you can do so by visiting our website at anps.org. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society, or you're always welcome to reach out to me at uh, anps.president at gmail.com. I'd like to also encourage you to join uh, the Arkansas Native Plant Society, and you can do so on our website at anps.org slash join. Uh, I want to give a little uh, brief mention of the next two webinars we have coming up in our monthly webinar series on Wednesday, July 7th at 1 p.m., uh, Dr. Adam Schneider will be giving a uh, presentation on the parasitic plants of Arkansas. And Wednesday, August 4th at 1 p.m., Dr. Suresh Sabeti will be giving a uh, talk on oak diversity in Arkansas and bio, uh, biogeography. So, our speaker today is Brent Baker. Uh, Brent is a botanist with the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission, which is an agency of the Division of Arkansas Heritage. Uh, within the Department of Parks, Heritage, and Tourism, where he worked for nearly 12, ha has worked for nearly 12 years to monitor and discover new populations of rare, um, rare plants in the state to conduct botanical inventories, the state systems of natural areas, and other ecologically significant lands. Uh, he is also the collection manager for the Commission's Herbarium, a collection, which is a collection of preserved and labeled plant specimens for, with an or for documentation, reference, and scientific study. Brent holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science and a master's degree in biology with an emphasis in botany, uh, both from the University of Central Arkansas. He was a member of the Arkansas Vascular Flora Committee and one of the editors of the committee's Atlas of the Vascular Plants of Arkansas, which was published in 2013. Brent is an 18 year member and former member and former president of the Arkansas Native Plant Society. In his free time, he enjoys native plant gardening and working on habitat restoration on his property outside of Darnell. But today, Brent's gonna to talk to us about the glades of Arkansas. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Brent Baker. Thank you, Brent. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so I wanna, give a shout out to Theo Witzel, my colleague here at the Heritage Commission. I did borrow a few slides from a presentation that he has previously given on the glades of Arkansas as well. Um, and with that, we will jump in. Um, so what is a glade? Some of you may have heard that term. Some of you may be familiar with what a glade is. Some of you maybe not as much. So we're gonna talk about what a glade is. Um, if you look up in a dictionary, what is a glade, um, you'll get uh, various, uh, <clears throat> various uh, definitions referring to open spaces in forests or uh, open space surrounded by woods, um, references to permanent or semi-permanent semi -permanent open areas or clearing within forests, basically. Um, the exact etymology is not known of the word glade, uh, but it was in use by the 13 or 1400s, so the late Middle English period. The word may be derived from Older English or Norse words referring to gleams of light or brightness, thus, you know, maybe a reference to bright clearings in the forest. <clears throat> 
um, when I was doing some research for this presentation, I was looking up, since the word originates probably in Eng England, I was looking up what uh, pictures of what they consider glades. And I was getting a lot of uh, kind of stylized pictures sort of like this, and a forested area with an opening, often sunlit with lots of wildflowers and ferns and grasses. Um, so I'm assuming this is their, the English understanding of what a glade is. If anyone on here is, is from England or, or has experience with the term glade in England, uh, please chime in in the chat and we'll discuss it at the end. Um, it glades also glade. The word glade is also used to refer to short grasslands or meadows within otherwise forested landscapes. It has also been applied to treeless wetlands, especially grassy wetlands or wetlands with a very dense herbaceous vegetation. Um, think Everglades in Florida, which literally means glades that go on forever. If you can imagine standing in the middle of the Everglades, it's a large expanse of, of herbaceous marsh land. Um, I also found reference to cranberry glades in West Virginia, which are a cluster of bogs similar to boreal bogs in Canada. Um, the term, the use of the term with regard to wetlands appears to be more archaic and, and not really used a lot uh, currently. In the central and southeastern U.S., we have a bit stricter uh, definition of glades. Uh, referring to areas of thin soil, usually associated with bedrock outcrops or bedrock just under the surface of, of the, the soil surface. Um, these are often barren or prairie-like habitats. They're usually treeless openings, often within woodland communities, but can be surrounded by other grassland communities, such as tall grass prairie, um, or in the case of chalk glades and blackland prairies, um, or in the case of chalk glades surrounded by black and prairies. <clears throat> um, even within the central uh, and southeastern U.S., there's kind of differing ideas of precisely what uh, is can, should be referred to as a glade. Um, some people consider a glade as more restricted to the bare rock and very shallow soil areas that uh, support cryptogams, which are mosses, lichens, liverworts, algaes, and annual uh, forbs and grasses, and maybe some uh, smaller perennial uh, forbs. <clears throat> And so that concept would exclude thicker soil areas that support uh, perennial grasslands, grasses and woody species, especially when these areas occur in very zonal uh, and in, in distinctly zonal uh, situations. Um, these areas might be referred to as barrens or prairies because they are perennial grassland communities and often have prairie species in them. In the interior highlands, so here in the Ozarks and Wachita Mountains in the central part of the U.S., um, we often include these perennial grass zones in our concept of glades because they're often fairly well intermixed with the bare rock and annual dominated areas. Um, and also woody species can be intermixed. <clears throat> And we often include uh, some wooded areas surrounding uh, the more exposed rock and, and grasslands as part of the glade concept. Although we do use the term barrens in some circumstances, other times we may uh, say woodlands. Uh, it often depends on the type of glade and how extensive the perennial grasslands and woody species are in, in relation to the exposed bedrock and herbaceous, uh, annual herbaceous dominated areas. <clears throat> so glades are often uh, very dry, hot and dry, at least part of the year, and can be very desert-like. Uh, because of this, they are uh, often characterized by unique plant and animal communities that are adapted to uh, these really harsh conditions. 
Uh, some have alternating seasonally wet and then very dry conditions. This is called hydrozeric, which means dry, wet, or wet, dry, I guess, technically. <laughs> um, so they may be moist in the winter and spring and then extremely dry in the summer and, and part of the fall. Um, some may have vernal pools or seepages and streams running through them. Um, as I mentioned, they often have drought adapted plants like succulents, such as uh, the prickly pear, the native prickly pears, cacti, cacti and um, sedums, such as the widow's cross. <clears throat> um, and fame flowers or rock pinks and yuccas. Uh, this droughty conditions plus the soil chemistry related to the different types of rocks, which we'll discuss further limit the types of plants that can grow in particular glades. Um, this leads to a number of uh, different unique plant community assemblages and a high number of rare and endemic species, which we'll also highlight a few of those later. Um, glades also support specialized animals uh, like the, this giant red-headed centipede and the Eastern collared lizard, which is also called known as the mountain boomer, um, which needs pretty uh, extensive uh, rock expanses and, and rock perches uh, for its habitat. There's also a, a grasshopper called the lichen grasshopper, which mimics uh, the lichen found on the rocks and glades. Um, you can find uh, Western diamondback rattlesnakes in this habitat, tarantulas, scorpions. <clears throat> Most glades are associated with uplands, so they occur on western, often western or southern exposures or high summits of ridges, knobs, and escarpments, such as here on uh, Magazine Mountain. Um, we have a lot of east-west trending ridges in Arkansas, especially in the Ouachita Mountains, and the south slopes of these ridges uh, are more exposed to obviously southern uh, solar radiation. So they are often uh, much harsher and drier, hotter. Um, so they allow for the development of these uh, glade habitats. <clears throat> um, before we get into the different types and locations of glades, I thought we'd look at a few of these diagrams of rock outcrop communities in the Ozarks that were in a paper by uh, Stuart Ware in 2002. He was uh, comparing glades of the Ozarks to glades in other parts of the Southeast US, uh, such as the Cedar Glades of Tennessee. But these diagrams are good for kind of getting an idea of the structure of glades and understanding how they form and what they are. <coughs> and uh, this first one is the uh, Flat Rock Island mat community. And this is where you have uh, shallow pockets of soil surrounded by bare rock. And uh, these pockets of soil are usually so shallow that they can only support uh, cryptogams. So that's the mosses and lichens and liverworts uh, I mentioned earlier. And then medium to small, taller uh, herbaceous, often annual species of, of grasses and, and wildflowers. And then in the deepest part of these pockets, you can get uh, perennial grasses that can take hold. <clears throat> um, so this can be seen in this illustration or this, this example here on Petty Jean Mountain. Um, in the foreground, you can see uh, bare rock grading into very shallow, very shallow soil where you get the uh, mosses and lichens. And then in the slightly deeper park pockets, you get these clump perennial grasses such as broom, broom sedge. <clears throat> Um, this is a outcrop margin glade. Uh, so this is where you're at the outer edge of the bare rock and you start grading into deeper soil. And rather than being an isolated pocket, you grade completely out of the, the glade habitat into deeper soil. So you start out with the uh, mosses and lichen uh, zone, and then the small herbaceous plant zone, and the perennial grassland zone, and then eventually deeper soils, you get, you grade into the shrub, and then 
uh, tree, so you eventually grade into the woodlands and, and forest habitat. <clears throat> and that's illustrated here in this uh, Nephilim cyanite glade. You can see the bare rock in the lower right grading uh, gradually different zones all the way into the shrubs and trees in the background. <clears throat> This is a bluff top shallow soil glade. So at the tops of cliffs and bluffs, you have erosion that erodes the soil away. Um, and so you have a similar situation to the last one where the, but the soil is getting deeper uh, as you go further away from this cliff face. And so you get that same gradation of, of zones <clears throat> such as here at, uh, on some Bluff top sandstone glades along the White River in Stone County. And these can be uh, very narrow uh, to relatively wide. It varies. This is a hillside glade. So in this situation, you're on a steeper slope and you have various layers of rock that outcrop uh, against this slope. And then between the outcrops, you get accumulation of soil of various depths. So you get these various zones uh, of, of herbaceous uh, annual vegetation and perennial grasses. And in the deepest soil pockets, you can get shrubs and trees. And this is illustrated nicely here on this Navaculate Glade and outcrop woodland in Hot Spring County. <clears throat> So now we'll get into where glades occur in Arkansas. Many of you are probably familiar with uh, the major natural divisions of Arkansas, which um, there's kind of variation in how many uh, are, are treated, have been treated historically of natural divisions in Arkansas. You kind of have a, the main six, uh, which you see here, which include the West Gulf Coastal Plain and the Mississippi Alluvial Plain, which are the lowlands of of southern and eastern Arkansas. You have a little bit of a higher ridge of Crowley's Ridge in eastern Arkansas. And then you have the mountainous regions of the state in the northwestern, roughly the northwestern half, which include the Washita Mountains, Arkansas Valley, and Ozark Plateaus, which are collectively called the interior highlands. <clears throat> now, sometime the, sometimes the Ozark Plateaus are further divided into the Boston Mountains and the Ozark Plateaus or Highlands. And uh, as was done by in the level three ecoregions uh, outlines of, of, of natural divisions or ecoregions. Um, and throughout the rest of this presentation, I will be separating the Boston Mountains. So when I reference uh, different glade locations, I'll be talking about the Ozark Highlands is more restricted and out separate from the Boston Mountains. <coughs> So this is a, a relatively newer uh, mapping of glades in Arkansas. Um, this was, these glades were mapped uh, by Paul Nelson, who a retired ecologist with the Mark Twain National Forest in Missouri. And uh, he mapped the glades of, uh, as part of the Central Hardwoods Joint Venture uh, of Arkansas and Missouri. And this is amazing, an amazing resource uh, that we have now. Uh, he painstakingly went mile by mile throughout both states, looking at all sorts of uh, maps and geology maps and aerial imagery and especially historic, you know, the oldest imagery he could find to map where glades uh, occur and occurred in Arkansas. Um, so we now have this amazing resource. Uh, looking at this map, it looks like the, some of these areas are just massive expanses of glades. Um, at this scale, I had to make the, the glade boundaries really dark and large. Um, but if you zoom in on a particular area, you can see the finer details of the finer mapping of these, of these glades. Um, and as you can imagine, this was a, a huge project. Um, you also notice the, even, even considering the, you know, the finer scale, you can still notice that there are extensive number of glades in the Ozark uh, region and uh, some fairly large glades up there too. And these are relatively unprotected and many are degraded by 
fire suppression and encroachment by woody uh, plant species, especially our native junipers, such as eastern red cedar. Um, and so these are areas that are of a focal area, one of the focal areas of uh, the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission and other conservation agencies to uh, protect and often restore these, air, these habitats. So now we're gonna talk about the glade types. Um, I'm, lump, I'm grouping them into kind of 10 main glade types. Uh, that number can vary a little bit depending on how people uh, classify glades. Uh, but we're going to talk about 10 in this presentation. Uh, five of those uh, make up the majority of glades in Arkansas. <clears throat> and they're not necessarily discussed here in extent of area covered in the state. I kind of did them on more of a north to south gradient, especially for these first five, and then kind of jump around a little bit with the, the smaller uh, glade types. So the first one we're going to discuss are limestone glades. So limestone glades are found primarily in the Ozark Highlands and you know, Ozark Plateaus. Um, they are calcareous. So their uh, limestone rocks are calcium carbonate. So these are uh, sedimentary rocks formed at the bottom of ancient seas from the deposition of uh, shells from sea creatures. And this rock often has a lot of uh, fossils in it. <clears throat> the uh, limestone rocks weather to alkaline or neutral soils, and they have uh, plants that are adapted to that, those conditions, and these plants are often called calcifiles or calcifitic plants. A similar, another similar glade type uh, rock and rock type is a dolomite or dolostones. So dolostone is technically the name for the rock. And dolomite is actually the mineral that composes the rock. Um, and dolomite is a calcium magnesium carbonate. Um, but we've kind of gotten used to calling both the rock and the glade types dolomite rather than dolostone. So you may hear one or the other, uh, but they mean the same thing. <clears throat> so dolomite or dolostones are also calcareous like limestone, but with a magnesium element. <clears throat> they weather to alkaline or neutral soils like limestone. Um, and they also contain many of the same calcifitic plant species that uh, lime are found in limestone glades. But there are a suite of, of plant species that are restricted to dolomite that are, are not found in limestone glades. And we'll discuss a couple of those later. Um, dolomite glades are restricted to the Ozark Highlands and they can form massive glade and woodland complexes. Missouri has some of the, the better, larger examples uh, of these, this glade type. Uh, the next type of glade we're going to talk about are sandstone glades. Uh, sandstone glades occur throughout all divisions of the interior highlands. So the Ozark Highlands, the Boston Mountains, Arkansas Valley, and Washita Mountains. Sandstone rock is uh, silica or sand grains held together with some sort of cementation, such as uh, silt and clay particles, calcite, and iron oxides. Uh, sandstone typically weathers to acidic soils, so kind of the opposite of the calcareous uh, soils of, of limestone and dolomite. But this is somewhat dependent on the cementation, because uh, there are some, some sandstones with a calcareous cementation. And then you also have situations where uh, previous overlying calcareous layers of rock that previously overlied the sandstone rock, you had leaching from those overlying rocks that are now kind of leached into the sandstone. And so you may get sandstone glades that have a calcareous influence and may have some calcifitic plants in them. And this is especially common in the Ozarks. 
Um, the next type we will talk about are shell glades. And here's one where we often use the term barrens associated with it, shell glades and barrens, or just shell barrens. Um, these occur in the Boston Mountains, the Arkansas Valley, and are probably most uh, largest and well-developed in the Washita Mountains. They have, and in the Washita's, they have uh, a very unique assemblage of species. So some of you may be familiar with uh, the Washita Mountains as being a center of what we call a center of endemism. Um, so there are a large number of species that are found that are restricted to the Washita Mountains that are not found anywhere else in the world. And so we say they're endemic to the Washita Mountains. And shell glades within the Washita Mountains have a, a set of these species that are only found there and then are only found within these shell glades. <coughs> um, so shell rock is a soft, finely stratified sedimentary rock formed from consolidated mud or clay. It often flakes off uh, really easily in these little uh, flaky chips. <clears throat> Shale rock can weather to either acidic or alkaline soils, depending on the mineral composition of the parent rock. As with other, uh, some of the other glade types, you can have wet glades and barrens or seasonally wet glades, uh, such as uh, found here at Middle Fork Barrens Natural Area in Saline County, which has a stream running through it. Some of them have seepages. <coughs> and the last major type of glade we'll talk about in Arkansas is the Navaculite glades, and we'll often refer to these as outcrops, uh, especially because they are typically found in more upland uh, slope and ridge uh, sites. So Novaculite rock and, and thus glades are restricted to the Washita Mountains. Uh, Novaculite rock is a very dense, hard, fine-grained rock. It's composed of silicon dioxide, which is a microcrystalline quartz. It is a, basically a chert that has undergone a higher level of transformation and recrystallization and some low grade metamorphism. So there is a bit of extra heat and pressure applied to it in its formation. It's extremely hard and very resistant to weathering. It's often called a ridge maker rock. Um, so you have all these other uh, softer rocks that erode around it and you're left with these uh, ridges of novaculite, which form some of the most rugged portions of the Washita Mountains. <clears throat> uh, Navaculite generally weathers to acidic soils, although there is at least one type of Navaculite that has um, some calcareous uh, in influence. It is slightly calcareous. Um, and like chert, Navaculite rock fractures with sharp edges. And you may be familiar with that in reference to Native Americans use of, of Navaculite rock for uh, cutting tools and uh, arrow points. <clears throat> so now we'll get into some of the less common glades in Arkansas. And I just talked about chert, Navaculite in re reference to chert. Um, so now we'll talk about chert. I wanted to talk about the major type, so that's why Navaculite came before chert, but now we'll talk about chert. Um, so chert rock is actually Chert rock, the rock itself, is actually fairly common in the Ozark Highlands. Um, there's actually quite a bit of it in our limestone layers of the Boone Formation and in some dolomite glades. However, in those areas, chert occurs in relatively thin beds, thin layers, and it's very broken up and shattered, and that type of situation doesn't make very good glades. So, the chert glades are formed on really thick beds of hard cherts. And this is extremely rare, the situation. So uh, chert glades are restricted to the Ozark Highlands of Missouri and Arkansas. And the entire extent of 
turret blade habitat can be measured in, in tens of acres. So not hundreds or thousands of acres, like tens, that's total. <laughs> and uh, these are primarily centered around Joplin, Joplin, Missouri. And we actually didn't even know we had chert glades in Arkansas until just a few years ago, actually, as a result of Paul Nelson's mapping of the glades in Arkansas, he discovered that we had a few examples in and around Eureka Springs. <clears throat> so chert is a silica-based, very hard, fine-grained sedimentary rock of microcrystalline quartz which is very resistant to weathering. Um, when they do weather, they weather to acidic soils. Um, as of yet, I don't believe we know of any uh, plants that are restricted to chert glades. So there are no chert endemic species that we know of plant-wise. Um, however, there is a relatively newly described species of lichen that was described from chert glades in Missouri, which may, may be uh, endemic to chert glades. Um, the chert glades in Missouri, there are a uh, number of their state plants of conservation concern that are found in their glades. Um, we really don't know much yet about the Arkansas chert glades. Uh, we don't have a good inventory of those yet to know uh, what types of plants occur there and if we have state, uh, state conservation concern plants in that habitat. <clears throat> Um, the next uh, blade type we'll talk about are Nepheline cyanite glades. Nepheline cyanite glades occur primarily in the coastal plain just southeast of Little Rock in Pulaski County and around Bauxite in Saline County. But there are also a few examples near Magnet Cove in the Washita Mountains. <clears throat> so Nepheline cyanite rock is an igneous rock. Uh, which is rare in Arkansas and different from the uh, sedimentary rocks that we've discussed so far. Um, so igneous rocks are formed from the low degree cooling and solidification of magma in Earth's mantle. Um, so this was magma that cooled and formed these rocks. Um, Nepheline cyanite is a medium to gorse grained coarse grained, hard, and uh, highly resistant rock. It's very similar to granite, which we don't have in Arkansas, but you may be familiar with granite from other portions of the United States. But Nepheline cyanite lacks the quartz component that is found in granite. <coughs> um, although Nepheline cyanite rocks contain quite a bit of alkalis, they generally weather to fairly acidic soils, but this can vary a bit. The next type of glade we'll talk about is a, a little bit different. It's river scour glades and also called river scour prairies. So these actually occur on various uh, rock substrates and in various regions of the interior highlands but they're probably most well-developed in the Washita Mountains and on sandstone substrate. They occur in areas where streams and rivers cut through or along sides of ridges, eroding away softer rocks such as shales and softer sandstones, leaving outcrops and sometimes boulders and cobbles of more resistant rocks. They occur in high gradient rivers that are very flashy uh, after rain events. And you get a lot of scouring in this habitat and in these streams. So uh, this helps keep woody species, shrubs and trees uh, at bay because of the, the harsh scouring from the floods. <clears throat> in this, the river scour glades and prairies, you can find a lot of prairie plants in this habitat, like uh, big blue stems, which grass, compass plant. Um, and in the Washita Mountains, again, that center of endemism, uh, you can find Washita endemic plants such as Arkansas Blue Star, Amsonia hubrichtii, and Letterman's Ironweed, Vernonia lettermanii. 
and also this clumpy grass called Cumberland sand reed, Calamovilpha arcuata. <clears throat> so Cumberland sand reed is restricted to this type of habitat, these, these uh, river scour glades and prairies. And so this map is showing the entire global distribution of this grass. Um, so the green, the dark green indicates that it's known from that state. And then, and we'll see more of these maps later on as I talk about other plants. Um, when the highlighted, uh, in this case, yellow, because it's rare, and other cases, they'll be green highlighted counties indicate that it's known from that county. So you can see it's known from three counties in Arkansas, Howard, Scott, and Perry County. And then a few counties in Oklahoma, and then a, a little further east over in Tennessee, Kentucky, primarily. <clears throat> the next type of glade uh, we'll talk about is kind of sort of two very similar glade types, chalk and gypsum. Um, these, occur in, these occur in the coastal plains. So these are a bit different than the uh, other glades we've talked about, which occur in the interior highlands. So the chalking gypsum glades are occur in the uh, coastal plain, particularly the western portion of the coastal plain from about Arkadelphia to Little River County in the extreme southwest corner of the state. So chalk is a soft limestone, so it's calcium carbonate. It's sediment from shelled creatures in shallow seas. It's more recent in uh, origin than, and it hasn't undergone the, the pressure and compaction that the limestone rocks of the Ozarks have undergone. <clears throat> and I don't actually have pictures of, the, of gypsum glades, but gypsum is a calcium sulfate dihydrate uh, which is a lot of fancy words there. <laughs> and it's, it's more fancy words. It's sediment from concentration and crystallization by evaporation in shallow seas. So you can think of this kind of like if, you're, if you've ever had hard water and you had hard water stains where you have this crusty uh, stuff that precipitates out of water as the water, water evaporates. So you've got this occurring on a massive scale in, in shallow seas, forming thicker beds of this precipitate out of, out of the water. And that's what forms these gypsum layers. <clears throat> Both chalk and gypsum are calcareous, and so they weather to, to alkaline soils and support calcifitic plants. And they're often associated with and grade into blackland prairies. The final glade type we're going to talk about are saline glades, also called saline barrens. So this is an example of a glade type where there is not an underlying bedrock layer involved. And uh, these occur in the Arkansas Valley and the coastal plain in Arkansas. They are formed in alluvial deposits of ancient rivers and they are high in sodium and magnesium salts, which uh, the thing about salts is, is often pretty harsh for uh, inhospitable for many plant species. So there, there are um, plants have a hard, a lot of species of plants have a hard time growing in these conditions. So that's why you get these bare areas. And then some species that are adapted to this type of habitat. Um, Saline glades often occur over a clay pan, which can be very hard and somewhat mimic uh, an underlying bedrock. They have low permeability and low aeration. They can be very, very wet in the winter and spring and extremely arid in the summer. And they have alkaline soils. So this is where you would find uh, this little plant called geocarpon, also called tiny tim and earth fruit. It is a federally listed uh, threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. The green counties on this map are its entire global, known global uh, distribution, except that 
It has more recently, since I, I made this map, been discovered in at least one county in central Texas to the west of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, so that county is not showing up on this map, but otherwise this is the most of the known range. <clears throat> um, in the counties that you see here in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas, it occurs in these saline glade habitats. In Missouri and in the new counties, the new sites in Texas, it occurs in sandstone glades. In Missouri, it occurs on uh, a particular glade form, a uh, sandstone formation that includes a magnesium component. So this is different than the, the sandstones that we have in Arkansas. We have searched for this species in sandstone glades in Arkansas because we have a lot of sandstone glades in Arkansas, but we have not found it yet. Um, we need to investigate more about the new Texas site, about exactly what kind of sandstone it's found on there and see if we have any similar sandstone types in Arkansas to maybe concentrate our searches, see if we have it elsewhere in the state. So now I'll uh, try to quickly go through some additional uh, plants, glade plants of, of interest. Um, this is Missouri bladder pod. It's a yellow flowered plant in the mustard family. It is another uh, federally listed threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. It occurs in southern Missouri and Arkansas. In Missouri and northern Arkansas, it occurs in limestone and dolomite glades. In the Washita Mountains, it occurs in shale glades. A couple of years ago, there was a genetic study done that indicates that the Washita plants may actually be genetically distinct from the Ozark plants. And there's currently a study underway. Uh, some researchers from Missouri Botanical Garden came down last month and visited all of our uh, Arkansas populations to make field observations and collect uh, specimens um, to do a morphological study. So they're gonna be doing all sorts of, of measurements of plant parts and examining things like hairs on the plant and stuff like that to see if there are any physical differences uh, in the Washita plants compared to the Ozark plants that can be used to maybe describe the Washita plants as a new species. Um, this plant is Gattinger's prairie clover. Um, you can see that the primary range for it is a little further to the southeast in Tennessee, northern Alabama, and Georgia. Um, we kind of have some disjunct populations over here in Fulton County and the, an adjacent county in Missouri. And for us, it exclusively occurs in dolomite glades. And uh, Gattinger's prairie clover looks a little bit like purple, our, our common purple prairie clover, Dahlia purpurea except that Gattinger's prairie clover is a lower, more sprawling plant with shorter stems, and it blooms uh, weeks earlier than purple prairie clover. This is a uh, narrow leaf milkweed, Asclepias stenophylla. You can see it has a wider distribution to our uh, northwest and west, um, but from 1953 to 2016, it wasn't observed in Arkansas. And we kind of feared that maybe it had been extirpated from the state. Um, but fortunately, Thea Witzel, uh, my colleague here at Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission, discovered a population in 2016 in Baxter County. And since then, I and uh, a couple of our volunteers have discovered a few other populations. Uh, and Theo, I believe, discovered another, maybe another new one or two in several counties in North Arkansas. So it is still here and, and it's around. And in Arkansas, it we only know it from dolomite glades. <clears throat> so it has very, very, very thin leaves. Um, you might think of uh, another thin leaf uh, milkweed Asclepias verticillata, world milkweed, but with uh, Stenophylla, the leaves are not world. They tend to be alternate to 
sub opposite, um, but they, they don't occur in whorls. And it just tends to be a more sparsely leaf, leafy plant than the Verticillata. <clears throat> uh, this species is Pelton's rose gentian, Sebacea arkansana. So this species was only described new to science in 2005. It was originally discovered and uh, noted as different by uh, John Pelton, uh, who some of you may have known and know of. Um, and still to this day, it's only known from Saline County where, where uh, John originally discovered it. Um, it's known from Nephilim Sinai glades in the coastal plain and from shell glades and barrens in the Washita Mountains, specifically at Middle Fort Barrens Natural Area. Um, it looks a lot like the more common prairie rose gentian, Sebacea campestris, except that it uh, tends to be a smaller plant. The petals are a little bit different shape, and it's, it's hard to see in photos because uh, the colors don't always come very true, but it has a, a much deeper, hotter pink color. It's very striking. <clears throat> um, this species is small-headed pipewort, Areocolon carnicianum, and uh, this occurs in seasonally wet glades. So it, incur it occurs in areas that have uh, a little bit of seepage, groundwater seepage, or areas that pool water uh, in the spring and early summer uh, and allows for this species to uh, survive. In Arkansas, it's known from sandstone, shale, and Nephilim cyanite glades. It has previously been petitioned, or it has previously been a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act, and it currently is petitioned, again, for possible listing and it's currently under review by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, that review will take a few years to determine whether it should be listed. And you can see Arkansas kind of has the stronghold of, of number of populations and size of populations. Although uh, Oklahoma, Texas, and Georgia maybe don't have as updated uh, data, so they're going to be doing some uh, surveys in the next couple of years to, to determine how it's doing in those states to help with that uh, review. Um, this is an undescribed species of, or we, we believe to be an undescribed species of wild hyacinth or camas. Uh, camas. It's a camassia. Um, Theo Witzel, again, has been working with uh, Western, some researchers from out west who are specialists in this uh, genus. Uh, to look at this species and work on describing it as a new species. It may be endemic to Washita shell glades. Um, it's considerably different from the common wild hyacinth, Camassia scoloides. If you try to key it currently, it usually keys to the prairie wild hyacinth or prairie camas, Camassia angusta, which is also rare in Arkansas, but only known from tall grass prairie remnants. Uh, but there are a few subtle differences. I won't go into detail on all those. It, it tends to be a deeper purple color though, pur bluish purple color, it's, it's really pretty. <clears throat> um, this is Church's wild rye, Elemis churchii, another relatively newly described species. Uh, it was described new in 2006. It is similar to bottle brush grass, Elemis hystrix, but it has reflexed awns and a nodding habitat habit. Um, it occurs primarily in the interior highlands of Arkansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma, um, but it's also reported from Alabama. In Arkansas, it's known from sandstone and navaculite great glades, outcrops, and woodlands. This is a, a fern, Wright's cliff break, Paleo Wrightiana. So you may think of often think of ferns as more of a moist, wet habitat plant, but um, there are a whole suite of ferns that are adapted to very dry, arid uh, conditions. And this is one of those. Uh, 
like other members of the genus in, in Arkansas, the purple stem and smooth clip rakes. Um, it's primarily a southwestern species, so you know, native to the drier, arid uh, southwest. But there's had been some disjunct, highly disjunct populations known in North Carolina. And a few years ago, it was discovered in Arkansas. wasn't really on our radar. It was an exciting find when we found it. Um, Theo and I found it on an evaculite blade and outcrop area in uh, Hot Spring County. And since then, it has been found on a couple of sandstone uh, glades and outcrops uh, near Little Rock. <clears throat> and these aren't showing up on this map yet. Um, Sometimes you get woody species that are adapted to these, uh, these habitats. This is maple leaf oak, Quercus acerifolia, um, which traditionally has been recognized as having four populations uh, and being endemic, it's endemic to Arkansas. Um, but there are, there have been some plants found in other parts of Arkansas, some trees found in other parts of Arkansas and a few other uh, states such as Missouri and Tennessee um, that look very similar to our trees. And so there's a understudy to see if they're the same species. Uh, but for now, we still kind of refer to them as, as the four uh, traditional uh, populations. And these are found on rocky ridgetop glades and outcrops and woodlands on Novaculite in the Washita Mountains and on sandstone and shale in the Arkansas Valley. <clears throat> this is round headed prairie clover, Dahlia multiflora, which was uh, found in a chalk glade in southwestern Arkansas by our volunteer, uh, av avid volunteer. Uh, Jim Kiesling, who has, does a lot of uh, plant inventory work for us. Um, and then Theo was able to go down with Jim and see it in the field and took this picture. So this was primarily a, a Great Plains and, and Texas uh, species. And so it was an exciting new uh, find for the state. Um, this is yellow coneflower, Echinacea paradoxa. Um, it's called a paradox because it's a yellow flower in an otherwise mainly pink and purple flower genus. Um, so there are two varieties in this species. Uh, the variety neglecta is the one that you see in Oklahoma and Texas, and it actually does have pinkish purple flowers. The variety paradoxa is the one that occurs in Arkansas and Missouri. And in Arkansas, it's known exclusively from dolomite glades. Um, these are some of my personal favorites and, and some species that I'm doing some research on. This is uh, the twist flowers in the genus Streptanthus, which is in the mustard family. Um, these are annual species. Uh, the one on the left is Washita twist flower, and it Maybe difficult to see in the photo, but it has these uh, very hairy uh, sepals and very elongated uh, pointy leaves. And the one on the right is Arkansas twist flower, which is also called Arkansas cabbage, Streptanthus maculatus, subspecies obtusifolius. Um, the distribution there includes the other subspecies. Uh, subspecies maculatus, which is the one in Oklahoma and East Texas. And so this one, the Arkansas twist flower is so far only known from Arkansas, so it's an endemic taxon. And uh, primarily only known from the Washita Mountains, except for a very odd occurrence in, in uh, Franklin County. Oh, and so this, these both occur on sandstone, novaculite, and shell glades and outcrops. And I should mention, uh, Washita twist flower was primarily known from a very restricted range in the southwestern part of the Washita Mountains. But last year, Virginia McDaniel with the Forest Service actually found a, a new uh, 
a disjunct population in Perry County in the Fush Mountains, which was uh, very exciting. Um, this is Virginia nailwort, Paranichia virginica. Um, this had been known from sandstone and shale substrates in the Arkansas Valley and Washita Mountains for a while. Um, but it's now also known from limestone outcrops and bluffs in Madison and Searcy counties, which aren't showing up on this map yet. And you can see it's another uh, sort of southwestern uh, arid uh, species with another, another disjunction over in uh, the eastern United States. <clears throat> this is Trelease's larkspur, Delphinium trelisii. Um, this species is restricted, one of those restricted to dolomite glades. It's a beautiful, bright, vibrant blue, uh, tends to be a little bit shorter and branchier and the flower stalks are a little uh, longer than the more common uh, Carolina larkspur that you most are probably familiar with. And that is uh, all we have today. I could do another entire presentation on, on uh, additional plants, but that gives you a little sampling of them and hopefully gives you a better idea of what glades are and why they are significant and why we at the Natural Heritage Commission are so interested in them and, and working to help uh, preserve them and conserve them. So, and thank you for joining and inviting me to pre uh, present to you today. Yeah, thank you, Brett. That was great. Uh, man. I had no idea that there was that many different types of glades. Some of those I've already heard of, but there were several that were new to me. So that man, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for um, that presentation. If anyone has any questions, uh, please put them into the chat. Um, and we'll look at those here pretty soon. And um, see, just for right now, while we're waiting, it looks like we're getting a few comments. People, uh, Sarah Gertz thought it was a fantastic presentation. and. Denise, Thanks, says, uh, Denise says thank you. Uh, yeah, and I agree that was a very good, great presentation, and we really appreciate it. Um, okay, we got a, a question here. Let's see. Uh, Jessica Bulin asks, uh, "What causes the magnesium composition in the dolomite glades?" <laughs> um, I don't know that I can answer that. Um... I don't know the specific origin of the magnesium. I'm, I mean, it comes from, I assume, maybe some of the ancient creatures that lived in the ancient seas that deposited, uh, whose shells deposited and formed that uh, rock. But I, I honestly cannot answer that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I'm not a geologist. I'm, I'm kind of weak on geology, so. Uh, you get into some of these geology questions, I'm, I'm not going to be able to help much there. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, we know you're a botanist. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, sometimes we know a little bit about some other things, but that's okay. Um, I couldn't answer that question either. So <laughs> um, Clark Mitchell says, great presentation. Can you speak to some glade management techniques? Sure. So um, often glades are... Uh, so fire would have been a major component of these ecosystems, uh, both natural uh, lightning strikes uh, started as well as uh, human, uh, Native Americans used fire prolifically. Um, so they, you know, Native Americans have a long history association with these areas. So they, you know, fire was a major component of these ecosystems. Um, so, Often when we restore glades, we'll often reintroduce fire, so prescribed fires, burning. Um, sometimes because uh, glades are so uh, choked with woody species after having not been burned for so many decades, we may have to go in and actually cut uh, some of the woody species out and either take them out or burn them on site before and allow uh, some of the vegetation to build up enough that fire can carry through some of these habitats. Um, in some glades that may have been uh, heavily grazed uh, by livestock over time, um, a lot of the more conservative plant species may have been uh, 
exterminated from those sites due to many years of grazing. So sometimes we may have to go back in and, and reintroduce via seeding uh, those plants from maybe nearby source uh, glades. Um, so those are some of the glade management restoration uh, techniques that we use. <clears throat> Uh, Alan uh, asks, well, what the Washita twist flower, when does it bloom? Uh, May, may start in April, but uh, often May. Right. Uh, Cheryl Hall asks, is the verbena that grows on glades different from the rose verbena that uh, is more sprawling? Um, the rose vervain or rose verbena is a common uh, species in glades, several different types of glade types. Um, you may get, in some of the calcareous glades, you may get another species called, uh, so the rose vervain is glandularia canadensis, uh, or formerly verbena canadensis. You may get, in calcareous glades, the uh, glandularia bipinetifida, and I not, can't remember exactly what the common name for that one is. It has more, more dissected leaves. Um, it, but otherwise looks very similar. <clears throat> right. um, Rosalind Emery asks, uh, do you know of any resources for restoring or protecting local glades? Um, I had that question in a previous presentation and I, I did a little research, but I wasn't finding I was hoping there'd be some like nice book. There's a, there's a nice book about uh, rest, restoration of tall grass prairies. And I was hoping there would be a nice book like that on, on glade restoration, but I wasn't finding it. I'm, I'm, I believe there are various resources you can find online to kind of get at different aspects of that, but I couldn't put my finger on something specific. Maybe it's time for you to write that book. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like there's a need for one. At least your original one. Uh, Sarah Gertz also asks is if a glade environment has a lot of cedars on it and a controlled burn will be conducted, will the cedars sometimes be cut and removed first? Yes. Uh, okay. And she understands that uh, they burn really hot. So, yeah. So, yeah, there's kind of a couple of different aspects to that. Uh, first of all, when uh, cedars get really dense, there's not much going on under them. Uh, plant-wise, so there's not a lot of fuel. I mean, there may be a lot of cedar duff, but that doesn't burn really well. Um, so even if you reintroduce fire with all of that dense cedar, the fire's not really going to carry through very well, and it's certainly not going to kill the cedar trees themselves. So yes, we often have to go in and cut the cedars out first, and um, and then allow several years of the vegetation from the seed bank to come in and, and grow some vegetation to make some fuel so we can reintroduce fire that will carry through. And then once you start doing that, the fire burns hot enough to prevent future uh, generations of cedar from getting established. Now, when you're cutting and removing cedar, or burning cedar. So sometimes we cut and remove cedar entirely. We just cut it and take it out of the glade. Um, sometimes we may burn it in the glade and this is done in several different ways. It may be piled and burned. It may be lined up in rows and burned or it may be um, just you let it fall where it, you cut it. And sometimes you may cut the, le the limbs that are holding up the trunk so that the trunk is resting on the ground uh, otherwise, when you reintroduce fire, that uh, tree would not burn well because it's lifted up above the fire level. And, you know, tree, cedar trees are very resistant to uh, decomposition. So they'll just be there forever if you don't get them on the ground where they can burn. And we have to be careful when we do pile the cedars because we do uh, sometimes have problems with a pile of cedars burning really hot and basically sterilizing the soil under that pile or that row. Um, so we are mindful of that uh, sometimes. So sometimes we may scatter out the, the limbs or we may burn it in smaller piles so we don't get this intense heat that sterilizes the soil under those piles. 
There's, there's different methods to do that. Thank you. Uh, David Darby asks, uh, he, he thought your uh, photo showed two, the two rose gentians uh, growing side by side. Are there any incidences of hybridization between these two? Not that we've noticed, no. <clears throat> Uh, Cheryl Hall has another question. She has found some prickly pear cactus on a glade. How can she tell if it is the native species? Mm -hmm. um, so our, our native ones tend to be smaller ones. Uh, the, the ones with the really big pads, you know, pads this big. Uh, if you find any of those, we're kind of, which we have found a few sites of those we're not quite as certain about those, uh, of whether they are brought in from other areas of the Southwest, some of the cultivated large pad species, or if maybe we have had some disjunct uh, native populations of those. So it's kind of hard to answer that. <laughs> it, yeah. So a little bit of research may be needed on yeah. that, huh? All right, and uh, final question. This is from Eric Sundell, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, John Simpson's Trap Mountain Streptanthus uh, does not bloom every year. Brent, do you know any more about that? Um, well, it's an annual species, so many annual species do that. Um, they, they have what we call boom and bust years, and we're not always certain why that happens. So we have years that the, the planets align and they have perfect conditions and you get many thousands of them blooming in that year. And the next year you may have a few scattered plants. Um, obviously it probably has something to do with, with climatic conditions, uh, rain at certain times of the year, uh, the degree of drought we have maybe the season before, um, we, we really don't know exactly how, why those do that, but um, that is a very common situation with many annual species. All right, and just a few comments from people. Karen Seal says, excellent, thank you. This is the third time that she has heard this <laughs> presentation and she still learns something new. Uh, you, Carter Karen. and Trudy Kerrigan said, very informative and really well done. Photos and graphics were very helpful, thank you. And Alan says, uh, just a final comment, that the Washita twist flower, an annual, uh, found some on West Mountain in Hot Springs last year, none this year. Hmm. Or maybe that was a question, I'm not sure. Uh, do you know if that's an annual? We can allow that. Yeah, all of our twist flowers are annuals. Okay. So yeah, you, you have that, like I said, that boom and what we call boom and bust years. You may have a year where you're, there are none or just a few scattered plants and then a year where there's just thick thousands of them. Gotcha. All right. Well, Brent, we really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us. And I want to thank everyone again for being with us here today. Again, the recording of this webinar uh, will likely be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, I'm just going to go over it with Brent, make sure he's okay with that first. Uh, our next webinar is in July. That's uh, Wednesday, July 7th at 1 p.m. Uh, at Dr. Adam Schneider will be giving a talk on the parasitic plants of Arkansas. Again, you can find out more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society on our website at ANPS.org. I want to encourage you to go on there and join. Uh, that's ANPS.org slash join to become a member. Uh, check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society. We post information about the native plants of Arkansas as well as uh, information about our upcoming events, uh, virtual events um, as well. Uh, currently, we are planning to have an in-person fall meeting in Northwest Arkansas the first weekend of October. Uh, hopefully uh, the COVID situation does not worsen before then, but that is the plan for now. So um, hope to see you all at that uh, up here in the Northwest part of the state in October. Uh, again, Brent, thank you very much. We really appreciate thank you. you sharing your time and your knowledge with us. I know I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm, I can, you know, I can see others did as well. So thank you. Thank you.